any size of business really, where data teams can become uh, a bottleneck, uh, not, not least for uh, producing and providing uh, data and insight, but in terms of the innovation. So I've just got some thoughts this morning that I hope will be useful to people if, if you're thinking about how to get your colleagues uh, or your clients more interested and more engaged in data, just some things that you can, you can think about doing. Um, so, without further ado, we have no clicker, so hopefully this will, uh, will work smoothly. Um, I think my first observation um, is that data is everywhere around us, okay? Literally, there is so much that we could capture, so much that we could work with, that we have to be really clear on prioritization. So, one of my jobs is to make sure that we are able to put our focus where focus is needed um, and not get our heads turned just because we love data. Um, feels strange saying that, actually. I think throughout my entire career, I've been the person in the room that just gets super excited by numbers and by data and the opportunity to measure the things around us. Um, and actually, as we, we carry on through, um, through an age where technology is enable, enabling great change, that's becoming less of a, less of a weird thing and, and, and more of a superpower that everybody can get behind. But data is everywhere. So how do we, how do we tame that? How do, we, how do we work with that in the right context in our business? I'm going to talk to you a little bit this morning about some of the things that I, I see every day at, at work. Um, there won't be, you know, I can't give you too much detail, but hopefully I can give you a little bit of detail about some of the problems that we're, we're currently trying to solve um, and, and just, just how, we've, how, we've tried to, uh, how we've tried to solve those. So in a world where we've got too much data and we have to prioritize, one of the key things that I'm always thinking about is how do I get data ownership in the hands of the business itself? And it's very much recognizing that one team you know, I have a large team, but my team just isn't enough in order to service the entire data requirements of a business that has 125,000 people. Um, when you sit back from that, you realize that in data teams, we have people who are often brilliant at spreadsheets, great at SQL, you know, fantastic at building machine learning models, so on and so forth. And those individuals are fantastic at making the data work, but don't necessarily understand the data themselves. And at the other end of that spectrum, you have people who are working in the business, we might call them operators. Um, and those operators, they really understand that data, but they don't necessarily have the skills themselves in order to make the most out of it. And so a big part of the, um, the journey that we're going on is to try and bring those two um, sort of user groups together, if you like, to make sure that we, we see that a team that working on a data project is made up of um, domain specialists, so you know, business owners, if you like, um, and data specialists. So the first point I want to make is it is really important to get the business ownership into the projects that you're delivering. And I think a really good example of that at the moment is uh, we're working on some projects with our uh, logistics colleagues. You know, we move a lot of boxes around the country. We, we sell loads of food, but actually a big part of what we do is to move that food all over the world. Uh, and across the UK. And my machine learning engineers have built some really clever processes to help us predict how much volume we might need to move. And they look at models every day, but they don't understand the finer details of exactly what that means to a colleague that's in a, in a depot, in a warehouse. And so by bringing those um, colleagues that are on the front line who are using our models um, in reality, it's really important that we bring all those two things, uh, those, those two things together to get, and get the value um, out of the work that we're actually doing. Now, once you've got the business really engaged in projects where it's not now just the data team, it is a business team with a data team, you can start to do some really quite cool things. And you can start to think about publishing data as a product. So, yes, we have some really important data that we need to think about in Morrison, such as the products we sell and the locations that we're in, who our suppliers are, et cetera, et cetera. But actually, we need to see that as if we were a, a business that was sort of almost selling this data. We have to make sure that we can publish this data to our colleagues across the business in a standard form that people can understand. How often have you been in a situation where it's, well, if only I could just get that data, I could do X, Y, and Z? 
by thinking about data as a product, we start to enable our, our organization to be able to find data more effectively, to be able to catalog data really well, and to really inspire that innovation between teams where we're really using data as then the fuel for um, the next best pro you know, next big project that's gonna deliver really great results for our customers and our other stakeholders. Now, when you start to think about data as a product, it's really important that we now think about interoperability. Because think about what I'm saying here. We, we started out by saying we need business involvement. It can't just be done from a technical team or a data team. And we want people to start to publish data as if it was a product that people were almost buying. Well, if we're gonna do that, we might sort of start out to, we might start to create almost like a wild west within our organization where we've got lots of products, but actually they don't talk to each other. So it's then really important that we think about the interoperability to make sure that actually these data products are now capable of talking to each other. So one of the things that is really important to us, you know, each of our stores has a, uh, has a number, uh, and that's how we, we kind of, in our internal systems, we, we, we think about different stores. Um, we make our lives really hard, though, because um, those numbers aren't actually numbers, they're, they're, they're strings. So I'm not gonna get too technical in this talk, um, but a computer needs to understand whether the data it has is either always gonna be a number, so you can do arithmetic with it, or if it's just gonna be a set of characters. And you'd be surprised to know how many of our systems don't make a clear distinction between whether it's a number or a string. And this interoperability point, really, really important in terms of making sure that now we've got these data products, they can actually seamlessly talk to one another without creating um, too much friction. Because at the end of the day, we're only doing these things um, in order to make it easier for our business to operate. And then lastly, really important, in the data teams of tomorrow that actually we are giving our business the opportunity to self-serve, so to answer their own questions. And so those four things there, you know, those of you who um, work in data or data professionals might recognize this um, as something that we refer to as data mesh. Now, data mesh is, is, is not a new concept. It's not something that Morrison's per se, um, you know, we're not the inventors of this. You know, we're not doing anything new here. This has been around for a few years. But it, it's actually a great way of, of recognizing that every single person in our organization benefits from better data and from the ability to ask questions of that data to do their jobs more effectively. Now, I was going to use this talk to start to, to kind of get into um, some of the details around how you land change in a large organization because moving from where we were to where we want to go is it kind of is about the technology, but it's more about how you encourage your colleagues to come on the journey with you. And as we go on that journey, what we realize is that we're moving data from being the problem of, of a very small number of people that maybe sat in the basement, you know, sat way off somewhere in technology, to actually data being the problem of everybody across the organization. Now, as I said at the start of this talk, I have sort of slightly changed what I was, you know, where, where this talk was going and what the punchline was going to be. You know, six months ago, I would have talked to you a lot about how what that does is it drives great innovation within your organization and it enables us to kind of free ourselves from using opinions rather than, you know, and turns us into an organization that you can use facts. But actually, there are some real parallels in this to what we're now seeing in generative AI. So I just want to spend a few minutes towards the end of this talk actually focusing a little bit more in that space because, again, leading the, the data proposition for Morrisons, not only am I uh, interested in, in kind of processing our data, but actually what we do with it. Uh, and increasingly that's about putting it into machine learning models and trying to move towards a, a more artificially intelligent world. So with all the investments that we've seen in generative AI um, over the, the last two or three years, we, we've really seen an explosion um, as a number of speakers have said today in the, in the last sort of three to six months, it's great to now have these systems that can draw pictures based on what I'm thinking. I'm rubbish at drawing. Um, it's one of the things I've always been kind of slightly disappointed I wasn't better at. But now if I can think about something, I can draw it because we have generative AI systems that do that for us. So what you're looking at here is an image of um, a shopper in Morrison's. Now, when generative AI was, was kind of, where we were first testing it before Christmas last year, 
you know, these were hilarious. We were having great fun just sort of seeing what we could get the systems to draw. And actually, you know, from the back, you might look at that and think that that's a, a reasonably sensible image. But actually, as you move closer into it, there are, there are clearly some issues with it. But one of the things that struck me is that no, no matter how many times we, we tried to draw a variant of something in Morrison's, it always came back with a green hue. Which led us to then think, well, actually, if we switched out Morrison's for Tesco or for Sainsbury's or for whoever else, actually, the brand and the brand asset is implicitly baked into the bias of the model. And actually, as, as somebody who's you know, quite invested in making sure that Morrison's brand is, is you know, share of voices increasing and what have you, um, that's actually a really powerful emergent capability of these things. Um, and so from a technical perspective, it's fascinating. But actually, from a, from a marketing perspective, it's even more interesting because all of the consistency in the brand work that we have done has now found itself in this image. Because over the time that these models have been training, they have been reinforced to know that Morrison's is this dark green color. And importantly, we're not the lime green of another major northern supermarket. So I find all this fascinating. And I think one of the things I was hoping to get across to you today is that for all the technical hype and all the, all the excitement that we might have around all of this thing, it really does present a really interesting opportunity for marketeers because it really brings us back to, and I'll, I'll labor this point in a minute, it brings us back to the point that the, uh, the speaker at the beginning of the morning was saying about creativity and, and the layer that humans can add on. Now, I have another image, and I'm just going to talk to you uh, before I show you the image about the prompts that we use to generate the image. So, the prompt that we used for the next image was data scientists looking at shelves in a supermarket. And that's what we got. Okay, so some really interesting things in here. It thinks that data scientists wear white coats. Um, I don't. Maybe I'm not usual. I, I think I'm happy enough with the idea that it thinks a data scientist is actually a scientist. Now, I identify as a scientist, so that's fine. Um, but I think it's thought that all scientists wear white coats, which, if you think about it from a logical perspective now, is a little bit dubious. But it's, it's fascinating to look at these images and try and unpick the bias that the model now has, because not only does it think that scientists wear white coats, it thinks that we all wear glasses. Because it must think that we all wear glasses, because it hasn't drawn somebody not wearing glasses. And if you think about how these things have been trained, most likely, the images of scientists that it has seen were wearing lab coats because they were doing an experiment where they needed to wear goggles. So on a superficial level, as I said before, we had loads of fun drawing these pictures because there were some hilarious things that we came up with. And actually, the more images that we generated, the more we realized that there was a lot of unconscious bias that are baked into these pictures. Now, th there are some things with, with bias that we have to be really quite careful with, okay? Because actually you'll notice that we have three males in this image. Scientists are also female. So that's something that we have to worry about. But actually, behind the scenes, there is lots of baked in information into the generative AI. Now, I'm not going to show you live um, a, a text-based uh, prompt, okay? Because I'm sure you've seen them all. Um, you'll have spent plenty of time playing with them, uh, especially if you're, you're working in this sector. But one of the things I've been doing with, with my teams recently is we've been looking at how to build generative AI into the workflows that we have. Very, very early stages, okay? Um, and it is very much, you know, it is not the day job. The day job for us is working out how many, how many fresh chickens we need in which store. But actually, it, it's a fun thing to do on the side of the desk. But as we've been going through that, what we've realized is that there is huge potential, but there are some really serious risks. So one of the demonstrations I was um, preparing to show our uh, executive board was um, a little, little chat bot that was capable of answering some fairly basic questions about Morrison's using um, generative AI. Uh, it's just something, you know, we, we literally built it on the side of the desk just to see what it was doing. So um, 
gave some really, really clever answers until we started to ask it where our store in Burnley was. It came up with a really lovely answer, you know, so it gave us an address, gave us a postcode, really confident answer, lovely formatting. Everyone was, you know, amazed by the power of the model, except nobody had remembered that we didn't actually have a store in Burnley. So the model is hallucinating. We have to be really careful with those things. And when you take a step back from this, so the, the kind of biases that are in these images or the hallucinations that would be in the text that we are generating, you start to realize that these machines are learning at scale from the information or the data that we collectively are putting out into the real world. So in terms of what that means in the sort of creative and the sort of marketing industries, it really brings us back to this idea that the winners from the generative AI revolution will be those with the unique content and those where the brand is clearly differentiated. So if you go back to my image of the shopper in Morrison's, the fact that we had a lady there that was in green, the model has realized that because every other picture it's tagged with Morrison's has that hue of green. And that's because we, well, I hope, we have a really clear brand that is executed brilliantly across our stores and our online real estate. And so for the brand that isn't clear on their identity or their distinction, the model is going to start to merge that with other brands, with other propositions, to a point where actually consumers are going to end up being quite confused. And the generative nature of the AI is not going to guarantee to represent your brand in the right way. So what does that mean? It means continue to be unique, continue to create content that is yours, that is compelling, that humans want to read. Because when you do that, that will propagate across the internet, and these models will pick it up, and the world will be a, a much better place, both for the consumers, but also for the, the brand guardians. So if I go back to my original point about data management, and, and my point around data being everybody's problem, not just a single individual team, it's because below all of the creativity and below all of the brand work that you do, fundamentally it's the data that you create that goes into that that these models are going to be reading. So now more than ever, we have to be really careful with that digital trail that we leave behind us because in, in the future where these models are reading everything we've ever produced to be able to create that generative layer, if we're not authentic and we're not clear on our unique proposition or our values or what we stand for, it's going to get even more messy in the, in the minds of the consumer and in the minds of the model. So as much as these things, I think we're, we're at a place in, in the development of them where you know, it's equally as exciting as it is scary because whilst we can see that there are great opportunities, the risks and the threats, I don't think we really understand. And actually, the fascinating thing is, uh, from an enterprise level like our, ourselves at Morrison's is that we have to be really, really careful with the risks. But I think as we, as we develop, um, we, will, we will, start to, um, will start to go past the ideas of prompt engineers. Um, so I don't know whether you've, ever, you, you've seen on LinkedIn that, that you know, there are job descriptions now emerging for people who are trained to get the right answer out of these generative technologies. I think there's also the concept of a data prompt engineer to make sure that we're collectively creating the right levels of data so that the models learn in the right way. So continue to be unique, continue to understand why you are different, because in a world where everything is being generated by a machine, that's the only way you're going to survive. Thank you very much for your attention. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.